libertarians are fucking everywhere these days. Uh, maybe you yourself are a libertarian. If so, welcome. I, too, am a member of the Libertarian Party. I've paid my dues to LP for a badass cheap plastic card that I don't feel like looking for right now. So what's this video about? Is libertarianism, uh, particularly the variety scene in the United States, a world-class set of galaxy brain ideas? Or is it more on par with a freshman philosophy major's most insightful stoned thoughts? And what we're here to do today is dissect libertarianism. Uh, we have to do this mostly without the aid of libertarians, uh, because despite my good faith attempts to have conversations on Twitter, handle right here, right here, no one ever finishes a conversation. They always look for an opportunity to get out and just stop responding, or change the topic, will not address the questions that I'm asking directly, something to get themselves free from actually having their feet to the fire and answering the questions. Uh, but hey, if you're a libertarian that is willing to engage, by all means, again, handle right here. So uh, today, specifically, we're going to be looking at one of the libertarians' most cherished ideals, that is private property. We're going to listen to part of a lecture from Walter Block, who is a senior fellow at the Mises Institute and then look into a few alternative points of view on the topic. So, as I said, this is my first video podcast, I guess if you want to call it that, of any sort of substance, and I am literally throwing it together just so I can get that first piece of content notched off my belt. But I know I have a lot of room for improvement. I hope you'll pay more attention to my information than my production, and trust that the production will get better in time. This is about getting something done. And I tend to be a perfectionist, you know. Get it done. Don't make it perfect. The other thing is I would probably usually write some kind of a script. But I'm really doing this totally extemporaneously. And that decision is intentional. Because uh, if I write everything that I plan to say... Um, I'm definitely going to lose some of the passion in my viewpoints for the sake of using totally proper English. And that's just a function of being raised by two generations of English majors. I can't help it. Uh, I can't speak bad English intentionally. If I'm writing it, I have to always make sure it is done to the best of my ability and then that means that I read it back and I end up saying sentences that are technically grammatically correct but sound convoluted and it just doesn't make for a good flow of ideas. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go uh, off the cuff with it and we'll see how this goes. And uh, if it's really bad, I just won't publish it. But it's probably going to be pretty bad because it's, you know, my first go around and I'm going to publish it anyway. And, uh, you know, I'll learn from it, and we'll go from there. Let's do this together, shall we? The first thing I want to do is take a look at Walter Block, who is, well, I've already said he is a Mises Institute fellow. We're going to look at what he thinks about reparations. And we'll compare that to another libertarian's views regarding slavery as discussed with a non-libertarian and then finally we'll take a look at how private property came to exist followed by a criticism of the libertarian idea that if one works a piece of land that is otherwise unused in their perspective uh, they really are the rightful owner to that land starting things off uh, Walter Block. This guy is a libertarian through and through. 
the 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 fact that he's on this website really should be information enough uh, on its own. He's also written uh, numerous uh, papers, uh, articles, done a lot of lectures, uh, books. Uh, you know, the guy is an extensively published um, libertarian uh, thinker thinker i'll put in quotes um no that's not fair he does think he definitely does think um that's not in jest uh whether those thoughts make any sense i guess is the real debate so um with that in mind uh knowing kind of where his political background is uh, let's listen to a little bit of his thoughts on um, reparations. Because I'm criticizing both of those other two. I, uh, uh, it's interesting, when Murray Rothbard was a student at Columbia, and he, he wasn't sure which school of thought he would uh, adhere to. This is before he came in Austrian. What he said was, he agrees with each school's of thought, criticism of the other school of thought, but he doesn't agree with anything positive that any of them said. Well, similarly here. I agree with each of the two schools of thought, the left liberal black and the um, right wing or conservative reaction. I agree with each of them when they criticize the other, but I don't agree with anything that either of them say in the positive case. What are the specifics? Well, the first objection Here's what Fred Reed says. Let me quote you Fred Reed. On the web, I find that Henry Louis Gates, the guy I mentioned, the chairman of Afro-American Studies at Harvard, is demanding that whites pay reparations to blacks. It's because of slavery, see? This guy's a beautiful writer. He is joined in this endeavor by a gaggle of other professional blacks. I guess he'll send me a bill, huh? I feel like saying, let me get this straight, Hank. I'm slow. Be patient. You want free money because of slavery, right? I don't blame you. I'd like some free money, too. Tell you what, I believe in justice. I'll give you a million dollars for every slave I own and another million dollars for every year you were a slave. <laughs> Fair enough. But tell me, Hank, how many slaves do you suppose I have? In round numbers, I mean. Say to the nearest dozen. <laughs> and how long were you a slave? Oh, in other words, I owe you reparations for something that I didn't do and didn't happen to you. That makes sense, like lug nuts on a birthday cake. <laughs> Now, this is a typical conservative reaction, and it's funny, and it's witty, but it's wrong. That is, just because Gates is wrong doesn't mean Reed is right. They're both wrong. The libertarian theory comes riding to the rescue. Here's what Levin says. Levin says, back pay for manumitted slaves is owed only by their former owners, not by anyone now living because there are no slaveholders in the United States. So in other words, what they're saying is, yes, I stole Matt's pen, and if I were around, if we can go back in a time machine to the slave owners, we could get them. But since I gave my pen to Dan, Lisa doesn't own the pen. That's just bloody wrong. Now, that uh, really kind of encapsulates uh, libertarian property views in, a, in a, quite a nutshell. Um, if, if something is mine and I give it to you, now it is yours. Um, it seems pretty simple, pretty straightforward, right? Well, uh, let's listen to another point of view. This one, uh, in the context of slavery. I am alacrity from Alabama, and I shall be swift. Alacrity I, from Alabama. Swift, swift yes. alacrity, okay? Yes. So I watched your Yaron versus your own debate. I watched it. And I just wanted to ask you a point. Of, can you hear me? Yes, yes it's your own, 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 I believe, is how you pronounce, how you pronounce his, name. his name. Oh, oh forgive me. Anyway. anyway. I watched the debate, and there was one point that there were several points, but the one that stood out to me the most one was when you were addressing slavery with him, and you mentioned how you had interviewed several authors about 
slavery and about how it was largely responsible for the economic boons experienced by various countries around the world, developing, developing what are now developed countries that were developing then from slavery and the, and, the tr- and the slave triangle, like Matt said. So I just wanted to say that I think that that is a bit, I don't know who the authors you spoke to were, but I think that that is a bit of an oversimplification, given the fact that slavery, while yes, it can be used to generate capital formation, it does have several detrimental effects technologically and industrially. In fact, <clears throat> it's the abundance of slave labor that, can actually inhibit technological advancement. And uh, I have empirical evidence for this. Would you like me to detail it? I have no. some data. I mean, the idea that if I have free labor, an endless supply of free labor uh, to pick cotton, so I don't now have to uh, develop a uh, mechanized cotton picker. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't seem terribly profound to me. Well, I see. But what is the point then when you say that slavery is used, is that slavery was a driving force of industrialization, economic growth, then when you say this that? entire because project, dri- here's what I would say, like, like tobacco in Virginia would not have been possible without slavery, without plantation slavery. Like, so whether it had later effects on depressing industrial development or whatever, it's just not, it would just, it just, it gave you the chance to do it. That's where those profits came from. Those profits were not possible without slavery. Yeah, I mean, and and I'm not even sure what the point of saying like, well, on day one, because slavery is involved there, that, I mean, if your argument is, hey, um, these folks were uh, idiots because they just, they went for the low hanging fruit of, of enslaving people and getting free labor. And that's the way that they uh, created the economic engine. They probably, they could have probably made 15 to 20% more had they waited a couple of years for somebody to invent a, um, you know, a cotton picker. But they invented uh, but, with the profits they got from slavery. Of, co- of <laughs> like, course, of course. And let's be clear here. Like the option of a plantation owner to, um, uh, you know, go and buy slaves or wait until someone invents a, uh, a machine that picks cotton. Like, I don't even understand what is... I mean, do I think that the existence of free labor that is far more accessible to everybody than machines that hypothetically might exist in the future, were there not free labor? Do, I'm not even sure of, like, aside from that not being terribly profound, what is the point of that? What does that have to do with the argument that we had with your own? Well, a few things earlier. As you said earlier, that if my argument is that well, they just should have waited for more adventures. No, I must say that, that is a mischaracterization. As to how it relates back to your own, I, I'm not even sure what your point was in bringing it up in the first place. I didn't bring that. up. I didn't Second bring all, up. I, uh, I didn't bring up uh, slavery. Uh, he did. I see, he said it was really easy to see brought, whose fruits, whose fruits of the labor these are. It's easy to attribute. Yeah, like ownership, and it's definitely not the history right. of this entire continent. Is that that is not the case? Exactly. And it wasn't I just like that. like the white people were brought over here in bondage to serve on those in those places too, mainly to balance out the black demography. Well, first of all, Mr. Cedar, I wanted to mention that if you uh, again, as I say, I was addressing specifically when you defended it after your your own had got done saying his bit. You then came in and said, but the author, well, that you had interviewed like half a dozen authors and you had said that that was the case. But the Dude, thing is, is that you're not even refuting my um, point. You're simply saying that no, they could I'm have not, made I'm, more I'm, I'm, if they didn't uh, use slavery. That's a hypothetical that could be possible. But the point is, well, no, they did get slaves and it did drive uh, the, the free labor did drive the development of a cotton industry or in the case of Virginia, a tobacco industry. It did provide opportunities for bankers in the north uh, to finance and, and, yeah. and export. Early it ports did. in the north were like servicing those ships. That's what like get some turpentine from like Boston, right? Like that's that's what those ports were important for, because the real money wasn't getting slaves to the Caribbean and sugar and rum out of there. Yes. I mean, uh, like, uh, you know, like, I don't know uh, the idea that 
um, I, if I start a YouTube channel and I get a bunch of, of views and I monetize it, um, well, that may be the case, but you haven't optimized it. Well, okay, so there's room for me to make 20% more. I mean, even if I stipulate what you're talking about, uh, which I will for the sake of argument, because I, I find it a completely irrelevant argument. What What is your point? My point is that you've grossly overstated the role that it played. For example, some studies say it's only responsible for about 5 to 13% of the capital formation. In fact, the, the role of slavery is even more detrimental to I'm sorry, you look at these stats, because, but how about looking at history? Like any of these colonies, dude, you look at the formation of these colonies and who's building yeah. stuff, who's chopping the trees down. I, Mr. Cedar, uh, I was not unable to hear what Matt, I believe that's Matt. I don't know who that was. Matt is saying that what? you are not accounting. You're looking at hypotheticals about. No, I wasn't finished yet. Excuse Peter. me. I was not. I'm going to explain to you what he was saying. You're looking well, at hypotheticals that are telling you that there could have been a uh, a greater return if they didn't use slaves and they, they uh, developed, um, you know, uh, a technology. And Matt is telling you, Look at history. Look at the way that um, that the people organize themselves. Look at where the uh, the sources of, of of revenue and economic activity were happening, and you can see that they would import a bunch of slaves. Now, maybe they weren't doing it efficiently enough, and maybe I overstated the percentage in which people, but. The absence of technology because uh, slavery may have an inhibited technology's growth doesn't in any way contradict the notion that the economy and, and that slavery drove all this economic activity. Yes, it does, because if it's only responsible for about 5 to 13 percent of capital formation, you aren't accounting for the other factors. For example, if you look at the, begin the roots of the Industrial Revolution, so you, and you actually find that there is an incentive for industrialization where wages are higher. For example, in okay, Britain, wait a second. Listen, for, listen, listen, wait, listen, I, listen. No, no, wait. I, here's why I'm interrupting you. I don't care. No, I don't care. Uh, I mean, even if you are a hundred percent right, let me stipulate. You're a hundred percent right. I grossly overstated the amount that slavery. It was just more of like a. There was no economic incentive for anybody to maintain slaves it was more of just like a they were doing it for hobby. fun they hated black people it was that a, much it was a hobby and it was just out and out racism what's your point i've stipulated my point, my point. Is, my point is that when you talk about slavery in relation to capitalism often as in the context you're referring to it you're you're drawing implications from it economic implications from it that are simply flawed when you overstate the amount is all that i'm saying for example as i was saying if you look at the roots of the industrial okay. revolution, let me tell you something. Your numbers I don't care. Bro. That I, I don't. I honestly don't care. I will stipulate well, that I am that 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 slavery. According, slavery. there's two opinions about slavery. One is that it drove uh, it drove economic activity, and the other opinion is yours that it's just about um, specifically wanting to imprison uh, people from Africa and get their free labor because it was more of like a hobby or maybe it was a status symbol or something like that. Gentleman Either culture. way, it doesn't really, I mean, I guess in your mind, it, it, it protects criticism of capitalism uh, uh, and a critique of capitalism. But uh, then I would say like, well, people were accumulating too much money if that's what their hobby was. I would say that we need well, to have confiscatory taxation so that we cannot develop such hobbies that would lead to the brutalization and the enslavement. Mo most millions. hobbies don't. Most hobbies are like collecting baseball cards. It doesn't necessarily. Well, I guess they do accumulate in uh, or, you know, uh, playing fantasy football doesn't mean that you're uh, accumulating wealth and enslaving people. Well, this just. What you stated, my opinion, was that people just did it as a hobby. No, that's a gross mischaracterization. People, there is plenty of room for irrational economic behavior. My point is- They were very irrationally economically behaved. I mean, I'm look, sorry. dude, go read about the Industrial Revolution. Go read about, like, what drove- I, I, Go look at the Biden. numbers of slaves that are imported as the ability for technology to weave the cotton, to uh, ship is, the cotton. That is not the only thing that I'm stating. If, as I'm trying to state, slavery existed 
almost everywhere in world history has existed for thousands of years. So slavery was not the driving factor. But if you look at places where the industrial evolution occurred and you look at wage rates, for example, for example, in Britain before the industrial uh, dude, revolution. Dude, you know what? Honestly, you're this, foolish. This, like, 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 this is I'm the sorry. most masturbatory is, conversation I could imagine. It has nothing to do with the conversation I had with your own. It has nothing to do with anything. I don't understand Explain. what your point is. Tell me your point. Before. Explain, but I keep getting interrupted, Mr. Cedar. Oh. Anyway, as I was saying, slavery existed everywhere in the world and existed for thousands of years. So you need to look at what makes places different if you want to see where new, if you want to understand the causes for new events like the Industrial Revolution. And there's empirical the evidence that high wage, which existed in Britain, for example, in Britain, Wages per day for workers were about 11 grams of silver per day, where in India or China, they're oh, only about Jesus. three or four grams of silver what per day. What so is my point the is, point? No. All right. I'm sorry. You've been on the phone for 11 minutes, and if you haven't said your point by then, uh, then it's just going to be a waste of time. And it's not because I was talking over you. It's because you're coming in and telling me that I had a gross miscalculation of the value of slavery to the economics of this country. Now, and I even stipulated that so that you could make your point if that's the only point then okay that's your argument this is what happens when you read econ to the exclusion of history facts don't care about uh your uh your feelings Matt. like go tell uh, william bird the second owner of 200 slaves in virginia that hey actually you could do this more profitably if you just hire white people no that wouldn't have worked they would have like this is about control race is a as a basically a technology for those people to exploit people um based on the color of their skin and they brought black people over so, because they were sla enslaving native americans but guess what they escape and you you have a tr problem with enslaving white people because you have the, the people from your home countries that have issues with that. So you s enslave black people because that's where the profit for tobacco is. Yeah. And his point, his, the point he's trying to make is that industrialization was happening at a greater rate and making more money. Therefore, what slavery was like an artifact, basically, and not like a relevant driver of like American in growth in terms of economic yeah, might. Yeah. The major input. Like, <laughs> Like we think about these things, like that libertarians like think they're like they know econ 100. They need to know econ 400, where you don't look at these things isolated from uh, like the British economy is uh, separate from the American one. No, where do you think like what? Where do you think that cotton is going? What were some years? of those? Stop it, globalists. What was the name of those books? Now, we had, we interviewed a couple of years ago. Like there was like three or four books on this that I I invite that um, that libertarian to read. King Cotton was one of them. I can't remember what the other two. Yeah, Sven uh, Beckert's Slavery's Capitalism was like a, a few writers contributed to that one. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, but even if I, even if I concede the point, which I, I don't, but for the sake of argument, I stipulate that, yes, everybody who owned slaves was irrational. And it was just, there was no, it was a drag on the economy to have all that free labor. So what? What's the point? That I mean, that, that there's working no backwards from your conclusion that capitalism is and unfettered capitalism is, and therefore capitalism go. is good. Yeah, yeah, it's not because because free labor, if free labor is not beneficial to uh, the capitalist, then why should a fifteen dollar minimum wage be a problem? Why should why shouldn't why 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 not just pay your labor? whatever they want yeah why do we have a system that constrains wages it's it's denial of really horrid history too that's I mean, the think of what pascal's talking about like about the haitians where they're brought over at 18 to die at 25 because like that's those actuarial tables getting developed for capitalism uh, how much peak labor can we get out of this guy before he kicks it and we need to bring over another boatload which like maybe 50 will die on the way over and we'll get 100 but that's still good labor for another five years that's the way that they were thinking back then yep and if it is the case that no wages um inhibits technology then maybe low wages does too so maybe the argument we should be promoting for a 15 dollars minimum wage frankly for a 25 dollars minimum wage is that we're going to see the increase in the value of technology i mean but also the, the that also reveals another aspect of a libertarian mind view uh mindset i say i would say is that 
they're talking about economic principles as if we're not talking about human beings, like that there is no relationship between, uh, you know, the, the economy is something that exists in nature. And like in the same way that like we need to like take care of the climate and that has an overriding, um, you know, uh, uh, immediacy to, you know, sort of like the desires of, uh, of, of people to, I don't know, burn fossil fuel or whatnot. Um, there is this notion that the economy is not a series of decisions that we make but rather some uh, thing of uh, some force of nature that exists outside of human beings. And there should be no relationship between uh, human suffering and um, the, you know, what we perceive to be a healthy economy. It's just bizarre. I thank him for uh, calling in about that topic though. <laughs> folks, there's more of what you've just saw where that came from. That's it. So that dove into uh, a number of different areas, but uh, you know the main the main point all came back to uh, origins of prep. Whoops, YouTube, you're supposed to stop. Sorry about that. Like I said, first time. Uh, so, as I was saying, they uh, are talking about, you know, some of the origins of uh, property ownership and um, how, how, how slave labor contributed to uh, the growth of initial capital that led to the industrial revolution that led to further growth of capital uh and so it's not really so simple to to take um a a, a, a good uh or a product and and trace it directly back to the original uh owner of uh, all of the aspects that went into creating that product, most notably the land. Um, and that's where uh, this article here about how did private property start comes into play. So, Looking at the origins of private property, um, perhaps the most interesting thing about libertarian thought is it has no way of coherently justifying the initial acquisition of property. How does something that was once unowned become owned without non consensually without non consensually destroying others' liberty? It is impossible. This means the libertarian systems of thought literally cannot get off the ground. They are stuck at time zero of hypothetical history with no way forward. Uh, here, is, uh, here is a point. If I put a fence around a piece of land that had previously been open to all to use, claim it as my own, and announce to all that I will use violence against any who walk upon it without my consent, it would certainly appear as though I am the one in initiating force, or at least the threat of force, against others. I am restricting their liberty to move about as they were once free to do. I am doing so by threatening them with physical violence unless they comply with my demands, and I am doing so not in response to any provocation on their part, but simply so that I might be better able to utilize the resource without their interference. And so it seems to suggest that libertarian principles themselves forbid property ownership. Uh, as, you know, 
the basic issue arises that property acquisition violates the liberty of others. So they go into some things like eminent domain, things like that. Um, here it says, there are many clear-cut cases of righteous acquisition. Once we understand them, we can use them to analyze fuzzier cases. What are some clear-cut cases? An individual living alone on an island grows some food, builds, builds a house, carves a sculpture, or quarries some rock. If someone else shows up on the island, the new arrival seems morally obligated to respect that property. This isn't just seems to me or seems to libertarians. It seems to almost everyone other than self-conscious socialist philosophers. Other clear-cut cases. If two people mutually agree to pool their resources and effort, then split the rewards, according to an explicit formula, whether 50-50, 90-10, or whatever, or I pay you 10 pounds of food to build me a new hut. Now, um... The problem with the case is that by clearing out all the other people from the island, it eliminates the liberty destruction that makes property acquisition so obviously problematic. What if instead of one individual washing up on an island, ten of them do? Then one of them asserts that certain resources and land areas are his, and that those who do not respect that claim will be violently attacked. This is more analogous to a real-life case of pro property acquisition where there exists more than one human being. It also clearly presents the problem of property acquisition rather than trying to get around it by creating a hypothetical society of one. And this gets back to in the video uh, where Matt was talking about how Libertarians need to be studying Econ 400, not Econ 100. And this is, you know, how I talk about libertarian ideas often being half-baked. Uh, that on paper, uh, at face value, they kind of seem to make sense. But when you start to unpack it, and you really look at the implications of everything... It falls apart real, real fast. Uh, continuing, the problem with the method is that the general folk morality of people, when taken as a whole, is not libertarian. Any assessment of how people generally feel about things in the economic realm would not generate the conclusion that they generally feel like laissez-faire capitalism is correct. We know this because no society ever selects those institutions and because libertarians write books all the time about how democracy is bad precisely because people as a whole are not sympathetic to the libertarian worldview. These people, libertarians, explicitly want rule by minority. They are in the minority they want political power, so they want rule by minority. And that isn't democracy. If you're going to say the proper normative folk, sorry, if you are going to say the proper normative method is folk morality, then it seems like you should actually take a comprehensive account of what that folk morality is, not just opportunistically pick off one piece of it. So that's one piece that talks about the origins of property. Um, this looks specifically at the, uh, the Lockean uh, concept of property ownership. Um, it says, property is held by right owing to its historical chain of possession from an original legitimate acquirer through voluntary exchange and bequest. 
Now, a quick glance at American history reminds you that there's no legitimate claim of voluntary exchanges involved in, say, the expropriation of Native American land. So, that right there introduces a lot of confusion about the origin of, you know, capital generated today. The, the land that has been passed down for generations that has been used to generate capital, that has been used to generate more capital, was stolen from the Native Americans. And it just so happens that Lockean properties, or concepts of property ownership, just start right at the moment Anglo-Saxons gained that property for themselves. And before that, property ownership doesn't exist. Which is just a ridiculous notion. Um, There's also the small matter of African chattel slavery and the ensuring 100 years of history of segregation to say nothing of the ways in which gender oppression over the past three or 4,000 years has shaped the course of current holdings. One might also note that many capitalistic fortunes are built on a foundation of copyright or even that many billionaires of the Walton family owe their fortunes in part to the existence of, redistrib- of redistributive, pr- redistributive programs that have bolstered the purchasing power of their core clients. To ask which present-day people would be richer and which would be poorer had we not had tax subsidies for owner-occupied housing and large group health insurance is to pose a fundamentally unanswerable question. And what they're pointing out there is that companies like Walmart pay their employees so little that they have to rely on government subsidies to be able to make ends meet, Uh, which means that the government is literally subsidizing the uh, wages for employees of Walmart and, and Uh, other Walton uh, corporations. Um, And, you know, I think it makes more sense for the government not to provide that assistance, not because they shouldn't provide it to people who need it, but because those people have jobs. And those jobs should provide... Uh, the resources necessary to live, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a minimum quality of life as defined by the government, such that if you aren't meeting that quality of life, the government will subsidize it. Uh, you know, if your employer is not paying you a government level quality of life wage then the employer is cheating and stealing from the government and therefore everybody that contributes to taxes for the government so we should define a set of property rights that on a forward looking basis are likely to lead to human prosperity That means fairly strong property rights as a crucial foundation of a modern economy, but also leaves ample room for redistribution. So, that's really all that I have to talk about today. I know that was a little bit disjointed, and uh, there was a few mistakes and the production value needs to be brought up quite a bit. Um, but for something that I threw together 
in under an hour, uh, literally, um, you know, it was just something that I had to get off my mind. And like I said, I want to get this uh, going as a more regular thing. And in order to do that, you've got to take the first step and just make that first piece of content. And so that's what I'm doing here. Um, if you uh, check out my Twitter, then uh, you'll see that I often try to engage in good faith conversations with liberty-minded people um, to try to understand, you know, how exactly their ideas would apply in a world that they could design or, you know, how they would like to see things change in today's world. Um, the question that I still never get a clear answer to, and it's the one that everybody asks, is uh, roads. So any libertarians that want to explain to me how exactly the roads and the streetlights work. Let's start there. Um, or we can start with property ownership, like uh, I just discussed here. So, thanks for watching. I'm going to have more topics about uh, libertarian things that make little to no sense. And, um, you know, maybe I'll even start putting those in the context of current events and things like that. Uh, I'll get better at this as time goes on. So, you know, if you've watched this far, uh, that's pretty impressive. You must be a real political nerd. Uh, so that's cool. Um, but... I do have to end the video now. We're up to 45 minutes. So if you could, I've always wanted to say this. Smash that like button. Hit subscribe. Share the video. And uh, in the meantime, everyone peace out.